The question is that this House do now adjourn. Ms. Tasmina Ahmed Sheikh. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I am grateful for the opportunity to discuss this important issue here today. While the public debate around the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, seemed to quieten down after the white hot heat of the general election, this issue is once again in the spotlight following the debate in the Lange report in the European Parliament this week. It is right that at this important moment in the development of this agreement that the House considers this deal and its possible, possible implications on our public services, particularly in light of yesterday's vote, albeit the report is an initiative one and therefore non-binding. Madam Deputy Speaker, after two years of negotiations, TTIP remains a highly controversial issue across the whole of Europe. To date, almost 2.5 million people have signed a Europe-wide petition in opposition to the proposals. It is clear from this and from the high degree of public participation in consultations around these issues that many people remain highly sceptical about the detail of these complex negotiations. This mobilisation of public opinion is a credit to the tireless campaigning work carried out by organisations such as War on Want and other campaigns, including 38 Degrees, which plays a valuable role in helping to inform the debate on a range of issues and to affording people the opportunity to make their voice heard. Before I move to the areas of most concern to my constituents and I, I want to start by stating that, despite its faults, there are some parts of the current proposals which have widespread support. I agree with the fundamental principle which has underpinned these negotiations. Europe and the US should work together to increase trade across the Atlantic. Trade is good for jobs. Scotland alone enjoyed £3.9 billion of exports to the US in 2013, making the US our single biggest market outside the EU. The US remains the largest inward investor in Scotland, with investment supporting around 100,000 jobs. I support measures which would grow the market for Scottish products in the US and back any plans which will attract new investment to Scotland to support our growing economy. Our export potential is huge and we must do all we can to support Scottish firms in maximising this. It is in this context that I support a reduction in tariffs which would allow Scottish firms to compete on a level playing field with US manufacturers because this would be good news for Scottish jobs. Despite these potential benefits, however, there remain a number of key parts to the proposals which, as things stand, serve to undermine the whole process. The lack of transparency around these negotiations has prevented proper scrutiny and diminished public confidence. Give way on that point. Yes, of course. Thank you. Does uh, the lack of transparency in the negotiations not stand in stark contrast to her earlier point about the huge democratic engagement uh, by the public on this issue and the huge concern that has been expressed, including by several hundred of my constituents before and since the general election? I thank my honourable friend for his intervention, and I am sure he speaks on behalf of many of our um, honourable friends and their constituents who have listened to us with similar uh, concerns. It is unacceptable, Ma Madam Deputy Speaker, that members of the House and the European Parliament have been prevented from properly examining the documents in the process. Yeah, yeah. At one stage, members of the European Parliament were only allowed to see the documents relating to the treaty in a secret room and couldn't even remove them. It is self-defeating to act in the public good, but to prevent the public from properly examining the work that is being carried out on their behalf. Yeah, yeah. It is also of great concern to many that in order to standardise the rules governing markets within the US and EU, TTIP will lead to the lowest common standard of regulations. <coughs> the European Union in particular has been a force for good in the creation of world-leading safety standards, which protect the best interests of workers and consumers. It is one of the many benefits of retaining membership of the European Union. We should celebrate these successes, not seek to undermine them. Yeah, yeah. But my main point here today, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership has the potential to undermine public services in my constituency and across Scotland and the UK, and we need to take decisive action now to prevent this outcome. The Scottish Government has already made a number of representations to the UK Government and the European Commission with regard to the possible implications of TTIP on Scottish public services and, in particular, 
the Scottish NHS and Scottish Water. I welcome the tone of the responses to date, which, should have, which have been of encouraging words about how TTIP does not pose any threat to the NHS. In particular, I welcome the European Commission Director General for Trade's statement that the net effect of the EU's approach is that nothing in TTIP will lead to privatisation of the NHS. But the fact remains that both the Scottish public and the Scottish Government must be able to see the final legal text of any agreement to be fully assured on this vital issue. Yeah. Yes, of course. I'm grateful to Mon Friend for giving way. I've certainly been contacted by a number of people who work in the NHS and by a number whose lives depend on a successful NHS. And they are concerned that TTIP may be the first step along a road to the kind of health service that we see in parts of North America, where the first thing they do with a casualty when they go into a hospital is to check the credit rating before they check for a pulse. I hear what my honourable friend is saying about the assurances we've had from the European Commission. Does she believe that the people of Scotland have had sufficient reassurance so that they can actually take the Commissioner's words at face value? Yeah. I thank you for the intervention. We say that I don't think we've had sufficient uh, assurance, and uh, the people of Scotland can be absolutely assured that every one of my honourable members will stand here to ensure that we will continue to represent the best interests and protect the public services that are dear to our heart and indeed dear to the people of Scotland whom we represent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The lack of transparency on this detail continues to undermine the public statements made by ministers and European officials. I am disappointed that yesterday the European Parliament failed to take the opportunity to amend the Langer report for ex to explicitly protect public services such as the NHS and yeah, water. Yes, of course. Thank you for giving way. Would the Honourable Member agree with me that the areas of trade would be better served being on a positive list rather than a negative list? So you'd include the areas of trade that you want to see within the trade agreement as opposed to all services and only to remove those that um, you name? Yes, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, intervention and I agree with what she's saying. What is demanded, Madam Deputy Speaker, and what we require is a clear and unambiguous exemption from the deal which guarantees that democratically elected governments in Scotland and beyond cannot be forced to privatise services and that any attempt to roll back previous privatisation will not be open to challenge under the new rules. These conditions must be explicit. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, we come to now one of the areas of greatest concern, the process known as Investor State Dispute uh, Settlement, or ISDS. Including this type of measure in this agreement potentially undermines the right of European governments to effectively regulate on a range of issues. As the Minister will be aware, the most relevant example of this is the recent action by the Uruguayan Government to legislate to increase the size of health warnings on cigarette packs in an attempt to reduce the number of people smoking and improve public health. In response, the multinational tobacco giant Philip Morris used a similar process to sue the Uruguayan Government. The concern of many of us, including the Scottish Government and our trade unions, is that similar measures could be used by private organisations here to limit our democratically elected government's powers in a range of important areas. Madam, if you can, I'm just going to make a slight slight progress. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, with your permission, this is an area that the Right Honourable Member for Gordon has considerable experience in, and I understand if he catches your eye, he hopes to raise this before the Minister replies. And I have to take an intervention. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. Would she also confirm the concerns that uh, Eunice in Scotland have in relation to the new uh, public procurement uh, legislation that's just been passed by the Scottish Parliament, where uh, Scottish public bodies can take uh, local environmental and social wellbeing concerns into contract, and that TTIP is a threat to that also? I absolutely agree with uh, the honourable member's position in relation to Eunice, and I'm now going to come on to Unite as well in a similar respect. In February of this year, SNP members of the Scottish Parliament, led by our First Minister, signed up to a pledge proposed by UNITE, which stated, amongst other clauses, that TTIP must not give current or future US investors new rights that they could use to sue any level of government, public authority or NHS organisation because of their policies or actions relating to public health care. My colleagues and I absolutely support that pledge. Of course, we welcome the recent developments on this issue as announced by the Commission in May, but there is still some distance to travel if the final agreement is to gain our full support. This Government must clearly state to our European partners that the UK will veto TTIP 
unless we receive an explicit exemption from the NHS for the NHS and Scottish Water as part of a general public se sector exemption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, we are very proud of our public services. Governments in Scotland, the UK and beyond must therefore be able to manage these services for the greater good without fear that their democratic mandate might be, might be overruled in the courts. I hope that the Minister, if I may make some progress, thank you. I hope the Minister can start to set out today how this Government is making progress in delivering the kind of deal that Scottish MPs and the Scottish Government can support and what the current timetable for agreement and ratification is. In particular, I hope he takes this opportunity to set out how Parliament will be able to scrutinise the final proposal before it is ratified. We must have a full debate on this yeah, important yeah. matter. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, in closing, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership undoubtedly has great potential to help grow the Scottish economy. We must ensure it isn't undermined by unwarranted and damaging provisions which put our public services at risk. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Alex Salmon. Yeah. Uh, can I uh, congratulate my honourable friend from Oko in uh, South Persia on securing the debate and, and thank her and the Minister uh, for agreeing for, for me to make a, a brief contribution on, on this subject. I saw a few minutes ago at the closure of the, the budget debate that the Secretary of State for, for Work and Pensions when he's in, it was in this place. And of course, he goes by the acronym IDS. Uh, and that's, uh, he's a very controversial minister at the present moment, as he should be, because he has uh, at the heart of plans to impoverish millions of people across the United Kingdom, yeah, hundreds yeah. of thousands of people in Scotland. But if IDS is a controversial acronym, then so is ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, which is the heart of the TPIP arrangement. Uh, I congratulate my old friend not just in securing this debate, I think our first uh, adjournment de debate in the, in, the, in the House, but also in the topicality, because only yesterday in the European Parliament, uh, by a vote of 447 to 229, uh, there was uh, an approval to revamp the disputed investor court, uh, which will be part of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. The text proposes to replace the ISDS system with a new system for resolving disputes between investors and states. Now, I, I know the Minister will appreciate the, the extraordinary importance of not offering additional avenues for corporate challenge to democratic decision making. Uh, in these islands over the last few years, we have had many examples. And for example, as First Minister of Scotland, uh, the government I led had to battle the insurance companies through the courts who were trying to prevent uh, those suffering from plural plaques uh, having access to compensation for industrial injury. I am delighted to say after the, first, uh, the inner council of the, the court of session, the outer council of the court of session, our highest court in Scotland, and then the UK Supreme Court upheld the Scottish Government's uh, position. We are currently, the Scottish Government are, are currently battling the, the Scottish Whisky Association who are, are trying to prevent the implementation of the legislation passed and endorsed by a democratic majority of the Scottish people in 2011 for the minimum pricing of alcohol, which we believe will save a substantial number of lives in Scotland and rebalance our, our relationship with alcohol. But that has been challenged and blocked and tackled through courts. Uh, the United Kingdom Government is facing a, a legal challenge at the present moment from uh, BA to British American Tobacco and uh, and other tobacco companies like Phil and Morris uh, against the proposal on plain packaging of, of tobacco, uh, despite the fact that tobacco, as the Department of Health reminds us, uh, costs 80,000 lives in England and a slightly higher pro rata uh, number of lives uh, in Scotland, where there are similar proposals from the, the Scottish Government. So we see corporate interest challenging uh, the uh, decisions of democratic uh, legislatures and democratic governments. But these are being challenged through our domestic and European courts. Uh, the danger is, of course, that through the system of ISDS, a whole new dimension of challenge is going to be offered to corporate interests. So what I want in particular for the Minister to answer today uh, is to tell us if he is in support of the revamping of the proposal which was carried in the European Parliament yesterday how that can give us some assurance that there is going to be protection of the public interest uh, against corporate challenge, and whether he is satisfied that we are going to arrive at a position where we are not going to have 
each and every democratic decision of this or the Scottish Parliament or other parliaments across Europe challenged by corporate interest who see, as we've seen in the, the precedents which have been cited by my honourable friend from Oakle and South Persia, who see in the avenue of uh, what otherwise might be seen as a welcome move towards free trade, uh, an avenue to examine and to advance their own corporate interests. So in a response that we are expecting now, can the government shape up and give us a position to show us they recognise the danger uh, and assert, as all governments and all parliaments should, the primacy of democratic decision-making in terms of protecting the welfare of our people and also the right to pursue democratically agreed policies without vested interests challenging these through a court process. Minister Nick Bowles. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, it's a pleasure to answer this adjournment debate. I know that you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and indeed I'm sure the Right Honourable Member for Gordon is disappointed uh, that it is me replying to the debate rather than his uh, new friend, the uh, Honourable Member for Broxtow, uh, who is due to be here uh, but is, I believe, uh, on her way to question time, where no doubt she may well uh, meet the Honourable, Right Honourable Member again. Um, uh, but I will do my best best uh, to answer the debate on her behalf, and if I do not adequately answer any of the very detailed questions that have been posed, uh, I will make sure that she writes to uh, honourable members uh, with all of the detail. Um, I'm happy to congratulate the honourable member for Ochel and South Persia on securing this debate on, it, on what is an important subject, and it is indeed a subject uh, that has been raised with me by constituents uh, in a number of emails and letters over the last uh, few months. I I'm glad that the uh, honourable member uh, did acknowledge that this is a one in a generation opportunity to create a very beneficial free trade area and that her fine country uh, and the entire United Kingdom uh, rely on trade, have benefited from trade over uh, centuries and generations. Uh, indeed, we think we're quite good at it uh, and that usually we benefit more uh, even than our trading partners from its expansion. And the government is confident that the uh, uh, agreement will produce huge economic benefits on both sides uh, of the Atlantic. Uh, the US is the largest export ma market for British goods and services outside of the EU, and a successful deal could eventually boost our economy by as much as £10 billion each year. And that is a large and abstract number, but that translates to additional disposable income uh, for the households that she represents and that I represent of about £400 a year. More money in people's pockets, uh, cheaper goods and services, more jobs, new markets uh, for small and growing businesses. This is what we are talking about when we are talking about this agreement. It is not an abstract or technical uh, process established by elites. Uh, it is uh, an opportunity for people up and down the land to benefit. I'm happy to give way. Does he still want to give? Yeah, I mean, the Minister made an interesting point there about the benefit to the economy in the UK of £10 billion. Can he perhaps explain to us where that figure comes from and what analysis was undertaken to achieve that figure? I'm very happy to get in that information. Um, I don't have it in my pack, but I'm happy uh, to provide it. As I said, the, uh, the Minister will write with any detailed questions that honourable members uh, have. The honourable lady referred to the concerns. I'm going to make a bit of progress if, if she won't mind, uh, uh, but I'm, if I have time later, I will. Uh, the honourable referred to the concerns that certainly have been expressed to me about the impact, uh, potential impact, or indeed the, the alleged potential impact uh, on our national health service. And I do think it is incredibly important because we, all of us in this House, have a responsibility uh, to provide our constituents with facts as we best understand them uh, and not to fuel scare stories. And it is important to say that there is absolutely nothing in this proposed deal that would threaten the public nature of our public services and, in particular, of our national health service. And she referred to, but I'm, I'm not going to give away, uh, she referred to, and I am going to repeat some of the words of the European Commissioner for Trade, Cecilia Malmström, 
who has written to a minister in this government in January about the NHS. And she said, and I quote, Member states do not have to open public health services to competition from private providers, nor do they have to outsource services to private providers. She went on to say, Member states are free to change their policies and bring back outsourced services into the public sector whenever they choose to do so uh, in a manner that respects property rights. It makes no difference, she went on to say, whether a member state already allows some services to be outsourced to private providers or not. So to be very clear, the EU negotiating position for the TTIP deal is to ensure that EU countries will be free to decide how they run their public health systems. The NHS our NHS, the Scottish NHS and the English NHS and the NHS in all parts of the United Kingdom is not at risk from this agreement. I'm happy to give away. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that you're able to offer uh, some kind of comfort. However, in light of yesterday's vote where there was an amendment for a specific opt-out for NHS from TTIP, uh, we were defeated. Uh, you supported us in the motion by 130 to 480. Order, order. I let the Honourable Lady... Let's sit down. I let the Honourable Lady away with it the first time, but the second time she must not address the Minister as you. You in here means the Chair, the Minister is the Minister. Tasmina Anna Sheikh. With apologies, Madam Deputy Speaker, I do apologise. Um, the Minister will note that yesterday's vote um, was defeated in terms of the proposal that it, there should be a specific opt-out. How can the Minister be so sure that we will be protected in any agreement to follow uh, here on, and can we be assured that we will have the opportunity to debate it? Um, I am certainly going to come to the point about debating. Just on the point she makes uh, about an opt-out, of course it would be great always to have in the text of any agreement all of the reassurances that one requires. But even before yesterday's vote, I want to be very clear, the Government was entirely satisfied that the position on TTIP was not one that was going to threaten the status, the public status of our NHS or other public services. We were entirely satisfied there was absolutely no intention on the part of the Commission and negotiating the agreement or on the part of any other EU member states uh, that that status should be threatened for our public services or theirs. So we are satisfied on the substance, uh, but I acknowledge that uh, a greater level of reassurance offered to our constituents uh, in any way possible would be welcome because there are people out there. I fear to some extent she prays 38 degrees. I would not be so kind. I think that they whip up a whole lot of ungrounded fears all too often, uh, and it is important that we as members of parliament then act uh, to try and reassure our constituents. I'm just going to move on because I'm afraid there are quite a number of issues uh, to, discover, to, to discuss. Uh, she uh, referred, and the Honourable Member for Gordon uh, dwelt upon also, uh, some of the questions um, in relation to uh, the ability that might be provided for uh, corporate interests to challenge uh, regulations. Um, and I do, again, want to be uh, very clear about what will be involved. These tribunals, these ISDS uh, tribunals, will be able to grant compensation for uh, actions and decisions by governments, according to regulations, uh, that investors can show to have been uh, unfair or, or, or conducted in an undue way. They will not be able to overturn or amend or uh, eradicate any regulations uh, that governments uh, bring in legitimately. And, and he, as a believer in the rule of law, and indeed as a, a practitioner of that rule of law uh, in, 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 a, in, in, a, in other phases of his life, will understand that it is always important that every decision by government, that every rule and every law that we pass uh, can be challenged in court, uh, in uh, proper tribunals, uh, by those interests that are affected by them. What matters is that ultimately the responsibility for changing those rules, for amending them, rests with parliaments, and there is nothing in this agreement that would alter that fact. Uh, I deny absolutely the suggestion that I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm an economist uh, as, as, as opposed to a lawyer. Well, on the record, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. But what was the revamping that was proposed by the European Parliament in the vote yesterday? Can the Minister explain how that revamping is going to improve the, uh, and consolidate the protection 
that democratic decision making has going to have against challenge from corporate interests? I'll be very glad to get him a specific answer to that question. Um, I do not believe in pretending to know things that I don't know, uh, and I'm not uh, currently with the information required to answer it. I'm sorry also for having assumed by his eloquence in this place that he must have at one point uh, been a, uh, a lawyer. Uh, I agree that that is an appalling slur on any man's character, and I withdraw it uh, unreservedly. Um, I do want to move on uh, to the important uh, question raised by the uh, Honourable Lady about whether Parliament will have an opportunity um, to consider uh, this bill. Um, and, I, and, and I want to be very, very um, clear, and therefore, if, if uh, honourable members will forgive me, I will uh, read a little um, from the text in front of me. Uh, the agreement is expected to be a mid mixed agreement to which the UK is individually a party. It will therefore be subject to agreement by Member States Parliament, including the UK, the EU can Council and the European Parliament. As part of this process, the UK Parliament will receive the complete draft text of the agreement in order to scrutinise it through debates in both houses. I hope that that provides the reassurance that the Honourable Lady uh, seeks. Uh, I note that the uh, party that currently governs Scotland is now very adequately represented in this House of Parliament. Uh, and I note the level of interest late on a Thursday afternoon uh, by her party, so I'm sure that she and her colleagues uh, will provide the level of scrutiny that she seeks. Uh, if I may conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to say that I am absolutely certain that this agreement has enormous potential benefit for the people of Scotland and the people of the United Kingdom. I'm also satisfied that this agreement will not threaten the public services that we hold dear and that we want in large measure to remain public. Uh, it, there is nothing in it that will do that. Uh, I'm also satisfied that there is no process in it that will usurp parliaments and usurp democratic processes for changing regulations or changing laws. But I absolutely endorse and support the desire to have proper scrutiny of an agreement that will be a very substantial commitment by all member states of the EU and therefore I congratulate the Honourable Lady for starting that process here this afternoon. I have no doubt that she will continue it over the months to come. The question is that this House do now adjourn. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. The eyes have it. The eyes have it. Order! Order!